I don't even understand how this is continuing to be a nothing speak, okay? This is like... I think you just coined a new phrase. Did I? Nothing speak. Nothing speak. It's bullshit. We have been chomping at the bit to dissect this article that came out. We know you've already heard about it. We know you probably already read about it and maybe watched some other videos about it. But we're here kind of scrutinizing some of the sections and passages in the article bring a unique perspective thanks to our 30 year plus oh, loan me. officer who me. specializes in government loans and now has worked on hundreds and hundreds of EIDL files and has, thousands. And has thousands. spoken to thousands, thousands. of business owners, SBA reps, files, transactions, small business owners, changes, yeah. All oh, you of said it. business owners. Yeah, I'm stomping all over your lines here. <laughs> I want to thank Inc.com for writing this article. Previously, <laughs> the only media attention on this U.S. Treasury debacle that has been going on for six months was an article in the Wall Street Journal. And Inc.com, I think, did a really credible job here of discussing these elements and giving us an opportunity to kind of give you point by point illumination and mm -hmm. more depth so that you can understand the program. So definitely a big shout out to Inc.com and a big shout out to our fellows over at the Skip channel. Ryder did a piece on this article a few days ago and reminded me that, hey, I was aware of this article two weeks ago and we wanted to do a video, we forgot about it. So thanks Ryder, thanks Skip and thanks Inc.com. And thank you, especially to our subscribers, all 10,000 or so of you. Oh yeah, we just hit 10,000. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. We started out with the COVID Ideal program in March and April of 2020, and we helped our clients get $70 million in approved loans. And then we estimate with the free videos we did here on our YouTube channel, including the how-to instructional videos, including the live question and answer sessions, that we helped small business owners on their own get approved for 30 million. This article in Inc.com specifically was addressed this COVID-19 EIDL program and how under tremendous political pressure from certain politicians in Washington, D.C., the SBA was going to take a huge tranche of the COVID EIDL portfolio and sell that off to private collection agencies. And we're going to get into why that's really bad by itself. The other element about this conversation we're having about the article is, with our expertise, our day-to-day -day interaction with SBA. I mean, I dealt with the SBA today all day long. We have a different understanding of statements that are made in this article. And we're going to go through those statements. I'm going to give you some insight onto that to help you arrive at an action plan at the end of this video that we need you to implement. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with you and the political representatives who represent you. Okay. I want to just step in here because I kind of manage the comments and, and say this is only if you care about consequences with your business yeah. and your financial future. If you don't care, then that's you can just scroll through. And that care means that you want a better understanding of what the SBA is doing with this program. If you have recently suffered the terrific trauma of having your COVID ideal shipped off to the Treasury for collections by the SBA due to their systemic failures under the program, mm -hmm. you definitely want to stay tuned and watch this video in its entirety. And if you have not yet entered repayment because your 30-month deferment period is just now coming to an end, you want to be aware of what's going on behind the scenes to help you make decisions on how you're going to interact with the SBA. Even though the SBA in their systemic failures, this does not alleviate you from having a responsibility to participate in the process to resolve the issue. It's unfortunate because it's not just going to happen on its own. You actually have to play a part in it, despite the fact that SBA is the one that screwed it up and caused this disruption in your life. This is a kind of, a, I don't want to call it a bone of contention, but it's a minor disagreement between we two financial services professionals. So let me just illustrate that, and then we're going to launch into the article. We have been assisting small business owners who hired us since January to help get their loans removed from collection activity at Treasury and returned to servicing at the SBA. And as I heard their stories, I just became more and more disgusted with the dysfunction of the SBA 
and its failures to help you, the small business owner who is their constituent, to properly understand the terms of the loan and understand the repayment procedures and help you actually pay the loan. And, and we're going to go into a couple of those errors in a little bit. We've done some previous videos on that. But Linda's perspective on this has been a little bit different. Her perspective has been, and we literally were at a friend's house at dinner the other night, and right in front of our friends, we had an argument about it because <laughs> Linda said, now hold on a second. If you're a business owner, you know, you got to be aware of these things. You got to be <laughs> looking at this paperwork. I mean, she didn't sound like that, <laughs> but she was really ticked off. And I pushed back. I said, you know, it, it's not entirely their fault. She's like, no, no, they should have done it better. She's not wrong. I'm not apologizing. As recently as today, the day we're shooting this video, one of our clients whose file has just been returned from U.S. Treasury, and there was a change of ownership thing that you know had to be processed, so I helped them out with that. They have two EIDLs, the one that was sent to Treasury and another one that she says is in repayment and is no problem. And she sends me an email with a statement for that loan because I needed the information. And she says, this is the most recent statement, and the date on the statement is April. Two things going to Linda's point about how you, as the borrower, as the small business owner, have to be better than the SBA. You have to be responsible. In this case, this client sends me this statement and says, this is the most recent statement. Well, was it really the most recent statement or did you just not take the time to mm -hmm. properly send me the correct statement? Because if you behave that way with the SBA, when you're filing paperwork them, you're in for fly. a world of pain. Yeah. Number two, if, that in fact was the most recent statement then she has another problem that she should be aware of especially since her other loan was sent to treasury and you would think learned the hard way if sba is lagging on the statement then wait a minute what's wrong with that loan and can i have possibly problems like going to treasury and going to collection because I'm not paying attention. So you see how we bring two different perspectives, but both of those are to support you in you doing a better job to be more responsible. And being busy is not, that's an excuse. I think the first step needs to be catching yourself when you're making an excuse and catching yourself when you're trying to say, this is not my fault, mm -hmm. but is it? You have the loan, so it is all of your responsibility. Absolutely. And it's all of your fault if you're not following the procedures or at least being proactive knowing the SBA Or paying is attention to the minor details, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. So here we get started with the article. In the first paragraph, they're talking about how the SBA decided that it will not sell one of its pandemic-era loan portfolios. So if you're reading the article, you might not know what that portfolio is, mm -hmm. and Linda's going to tell you. The portfolio is the COVID-19 EIDL program because of the historic natural disaster EIDL program that's been around since 1953. There's a distinction between the two EIDL programs. Yes. This one's COVID-19. So well said. <laughs> I feel like we should just call it a day and go get some lunch. Okay. <laughs> the article claims that this program has, and I quote, an estimated default rate in the double digits. Well, we'll do some math later on, which will make you chuckle, then it's going to make her chuckle too. Let's talk about what does that mean? Let's define default. You're not paying the loan back. Right. What? Or no, default could also be, although I think the treasury transfer was because of non-payment, but you can be in default because of you sold your business, you brought an investor on. You sold you, assets, yeah, yeah, things yeah, like that, things without like that. interacting with the SBA as per the terms of the loan agreement. But in this case, it's primarily defaults for non-payment. But what does that mean, non-payment? Does it mean somebody who never made any payments and is a deadbeat and doesn't care, and like, right. I don't care, I'm not gonna pay, my business failed. That's actually not what it means. It yeah. means that you can be 30 days late on your payment, mm -hmm. and that puts you into, quote, default status. And then by federal regulation, once you've gotten to 120 days delinquency on payments, the SBA must automatically assign your loan for collections to the United States Treasury, which adds a 30% penalty. They can sell your loan to a private collection agency. They can garnish wages, W-2s, offset tax refunds, and so forth. The other thing, too, though, about 
non-payment versus another form of default is, you know, there are people who may not have been able to pay the designated amount per the loan agreement for the monthly payment. So they opted for a lower payment because they wanted to pay something, but maybe they didn't apply for hardship or maybe they didn't apply for an extension for the hardship. I mean, these are all things that SBA isn't really good at documenting. They're not really good at communicating on how you may be missing the mark on the exact price process that you should follow to be ahead of the SBA. And that's why we say be better than the SBA because you want to have everything documented. We've done videos on this before, but to just hit on the bullet points of how your loan can wind up in a default status for non-payment, you never got a notification that your first payment was coming up. Or you got the notification, and I've seen them when you get them, they're ambiguous. They're not specific. They don't tell you the date. It just says, it's happening soon log into the my sba portal but it doesn't tell you the date when your mortgage payment is coming due your car payment it gives you a date yeah. next a lot of borrowers were confused about the end of the 30-month deferment period mm -hmm. and again we have a huge tranche of those loans our estimate somewhere around a million to 1.2 million that are coming due this month in june and through october at the end of the deferment period but a lot of people thought the deferment period started when they had their second Increase, round their increase. loan increase which a lot of people have told me on the phone oh, i got my second loan i'm like you got one loan and you got a modification with an increase yes but again because of sba's poor communications poor education they didn't teach people about this uh, this element next was the technology issue back in 2022 if you wanted to pay your loan you created an account in something called pay.gov but then in early 2023 sba transitioned that to a new portal called my sba and there was a whole host of problems with mm -hmm. that yeah next ach payments people who scheduled a payment and then the sba literally did not go into their account on the assigned date mm -hmm. to take the money and instead of notifying the borrower about a failed payment especially if it was an auto pay in that field, they just made it a delinquent payment for next month mm -hmm. and they didn't really tell you that. Also, Linda mentioned the hardship program, which gives you reduced payments for six month periods. Not only did the SBA keep that a massive secret in early 2023, they managed it terribly. People would call and say, I'm having difficulty making payments and the SBA representatives would not offer it to them as an accommodation to help them manage repaying the loan. And then lastly, that phone call to the SBA to this day we tell people whenever possible do not call the SBA you are wasting your time you're going to get wrong information so let's go back to the double digits and I default yeah, yeah and I think you were gonna bring in the OIG report oh the infamous Office of Inspector General report we have done videos on this before last year between political pressure from politicians who don't understand the program and or do not support you small business owners and we'll talk about that coming up the SBA's Office of Inspector General this guy went out there he would talk to any news reporter you can get in front of any politician you can get in front of any congressional or Senate committee he could talk to and claims that his Office of Inspector General which is supposed to help the agency prevent fraud and prosecute criminal behavior estimated massive fraud mm -hmm. massive default wasn't massive. like half they were, yeah. they were predicting he half. claimed that two million out of the four million loans were fraudulent oh the fraudulent this guy is okay. so out of touch with reality and again we've done these videos so I'm not gonna drag it through the mud yet again even though I really want to <laughs> but this article is talking about an estimated default rate in the double digits and again that's estimated and who provided that estimate the Office of Inspector General report, so which, convenient. as per our previous videos, you cannot take that for the paper it's written on. Next section that we want to discuss here in the article is, this is a long-awaited decision that arrives after Republican lawmakers have long called for a sale of the portfolio and put all that extra pressure on the SBA. Okay. I have a lot to say about this because there's not much to say. <laughs> <laughs> the politicians, just like Trevor said with the OIG report, it's not worth the paper that it's written on. These political officials, what they say is not worth the air they are breathing Ooh. because their little sound bites are self-serving and it's an election year, number one. But number two, small business is the backbone of the economy. Okay, except for, I'm sorry, why is the SBA the most underfunded agency in our U.S. national government? 
government when they have such a monumental mission of what they need to accomplish to manage all of these small business loans. Forget about the COVID-19 EIDL loan, the ongoing natural disaster EIDL loans that are constantly declined and all the dysfunction behind that program and that process. These politicians, honestly, I'm just, it's, it's a joke and they're failing and they're failing you, they're failing us, they're failing all of us on how the SBA is managed and how these loans are managed. We're not gonna talk about the F word. We're not talking about the F word, okay? Forgiveness. Oh, we are going to talk about the F word. Oh, we it are? comes up later in the oh, okay. It actually says it in the article. The oh, loans are oh, not okay. forgivable. Okay. But I'm glad okay. you brought that up. Yeah. But as so far, we're doing the F word. As far as the politicians, I mean, yes, do, have we done a ton of videos on contacting your local politicians and mm -hmm. talking to them about, writing to them about how SBA is underfunded, giving them information about your loan so that they can move the needle on the process with the SBA. But the overall bottom line, IMHO, in our humble opinion, is that they have failed small business. They don't know small business. They're not small business owners. I don't even know the handful of the very small population of politicians that are business owners. And I know they're probably rock stars. But for the most part, these career politicians are a joke. Sorry, I'm not sorry. Next section in the article, and I love this one because in a little while, I'm going to use the number in this sentence to do some quick math for you, you know, like third grade arithmetic. But, quote, given the extraordinary default rate estimated at 37% of the EIDL portfolio. You want to talk about the <laughs> extraordinary default rate? Just to remind our audience, even though we rambled about it a moment ago. Yeah. It's a bad estimate because I don't know how they can calculate something that isn't even functioning properly. Ooh. And Spoken like a true insurance underwriter. Yeah. How can you even know when the data is, they don't even know how to read financial statements. You think they're going to know how to do math? We're going to do the math in a moment. <laughs> But anyway, they want to make it look worse because of all the bigger picture things that are going on that benefit not us, that benefit the government and to benefit all the politicians having their say of how great they did this and how they great they did that. But failure upon failure, you think they're going to have an accurate estimate with all the failures that have been going on? I don't think so. Next. Next section, selling the portfolio would require that anyone in the private market that buys this defaulted portfolio, they would buy it and they would demand a steep discount on the value of the portfolio. So that's the haircut part. Yeah. Snip, 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 snip. By the way, I need a haircut, just saying. Yeah, I mean, just, I just don't believe anything that's it's being- It's the haircut part, but the other element is if these loans are transferred, yeah. And, and by the way, SBA is not completely ruling out the opportunity somewhere in the future that with defaulted loans, they do have the option to sell this portfolio off or a portion of it. And if that happens for you small business owners, you are in an even worse yeah. position than you are if the Treasury is handling it. Because <laughs> if a private portfolio lender, capitalization company, buys a section of this portfolio from the SBA, they're going to come after you oh, hard, hard and fast for the debt because they want their money. Yeah. And they're going to assign you to private collection agencies. You know, if you have a defaulted credit card, a defaulted car loan, and it, this, the credit card company sells that to a collection agency, they sell it with the haircut for pennies on the dollar. And that collection agency wants to maximize its return on that investment. And they are going to, we know the tactics, you know the tactics collecting, collection agencies can undertake. Okay, first, when someone buys a loan portfolio like this, this is not a charity. This is ROI in action. They want to get their pound of flesh behind what they invested in. And they invested in you failing in making payments. Yep. That means they're gonna come after you to collect. This is not a charitable organization that is going to be nice to you because you failed to pay back a loan. Which is Linda's way of saying, you're mm. better off with the SBA. Oh, okay, next. The Hardship Accommodation Program, HAP, is to give you a stretch of time to be alleviated from the monthly payment that is in your loan agreement. And we just did a video on this where you can get six-month extensions with a lower amount for up to a total of two years. Each 
six month period has a tiered level of reduction of your payment. In other words, you can't just pick and choose what, how much you want to pay. You can ask for up to 90% reduction, reduction. Yeah. with a minimum of $25. That doesn't always apply the same to everybody. And I just want to side note, if you are listening to people because something worked for them and their loan, it doesn't mean it's going to work for your loan. Right. Please stop listening to people because they had one experience. It doesn't mean it's going to work. Our advice <laughs> is based upon thousands, and we're still working on transactions every day. And another part of the hardship accommodation program is if your loan is less than $200,000, generally speaking, you should be able to request hardship directly on your profile on the MySBA portal. If your loan is $200,000 or greater, you must send an email to the SBA to request that. And then they will send you an application that you have to fill out and submit that back, signed by the business owners, all of them, and include a profit and loss statement. Yes, and we've had comments where people were like, I didn't submit a PL and I got approved. That's good for you, but that doesn't mean it applies to everybody, especially depending on the status of their loan. Because we are dealing with it right now where people can't get approved for hardship without a PL. If you did, then that's great. But don't put your success on someone's hope that as it'll the, happen the to them. And all. Yeah. Yeah. There are three features when you're getting advice from people. There's their unique experience. You know, each business has its own unique story. Secondly, each borrower's situation Mm -hmm. with regard to the loan in terms of revenue, ability to pay, other features, that's a unique perspective. And the third element is with the SBA, as we have learned for four years now of dealing with them, there is no such thing as one size fits all. Next, the next passage is as follows. So instead of selling its portfolio, the SBA has opened a center in Fort Worth that's dedicated to mm. advising and servicing EIDL borrowers. Do you see me shaking my head, Linda yes. Ray? Do you see yes. me shaking my head? Yes. Do you, you know why I'm shaking my head? Because that's not going to work. Well, it, it, it's, it's already not working, but, <laughs> but, but, but. Where's the announcement from the SBA to tell you, uh, yes. the borrowers, the constituents, when you have a mortgage? And I was a mortgage lender for 30 years. And if we took your mortgage loan that we gave you to buy your house and then we sold it off, guess what you got? You got two things. You got a goodbye letter from mm -hmm. us, the mortgage company, and then you got a hello letter from the next mortgage company that's telling you, Hi, we're your new mortgage servicer, and here's where you send the payments. Yeah. Here's where you call for customer service. Here's what you do if you have a problem or if you have a question. Where's the SBA announcement? Did you any, any of you? We would love to see in the comments, you yeah. folks who have been notified by the SBA in writing that there's a new servicing center in Fort Worth for your COVID-19 yeah, deal. Don't worry. We'll, we'll sit here. We'll wait. I don't know where the SBA thinks that being the best kept secret is a viable option for small business owners, especially when small business owners are kind of like running their business and not knowing how government bureaucracy works with applying for a business loan that they may not have ever done before, except for because of the pandemic. A lot of the way the SBA operates is they kind of have this cultural aspect that they think you all do nothing all day long, <laughs> except think about the SBA. I know of two people who do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're actually looking at those two people because this is what we do for a living. You're not thinking about the SBA all day long, right? Next. This one's good that I can't wait to sink our teeth into, <laughs> given the other stats that we just discussed. Here we go. The agency said that nearly 74% of the businesses are making their payments, have paid, or are still on track to pay. Okay, so then how is it that there is a 37%? The math doesn't add up. 74 plus 37 is 111%. Fail. Especially because here's the other element that's not included in here. There's a whole bunch of these loans that have not entered full repayment yet because their 30 month deferment periods are just ending now in June through October of 2024. 
how can you have 74% repayment, 37% default, when not all of the 4 million loans are actually in repayment? Next. This is an ASMR introduction <laughs> of Linda to help you dispel that magical, fantastical mm. thinking that's floating around in your brain right now. Take it away, Linda Ray. Yeah. Unlike the payroll protection program, loans that businesses took out during the earlier stages of the pandemic, EIDL loans are not eligible for forgiveness and must be repaid. Wait, they're not eligible for what? Forgiveness. For what? For, <laughs> forgive me. I've said it three times. <laughs> That's the F word. I thought I messed up. I it's the F word. Go to our website, auroraconsulting.biz. There's a free download about forgiveness. You can see the research that I did yeah. and that proves to you why these loans are not now and most likely will never be forgivable. Yeah. If you just like to complain about it and if that gives you joy somehow, some way, I don't know why it would, but then, you know, go on and complain about it. But it, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your energy and refocus on how you're going to find new clients. How are you going to make money, find yeah. leads, close yeah. deals? And please do not compare forgiveness for your COVID <laughs> EIDL with student loans. <gasps> they are completely ah. different because you see the forgiveness program for the student loans is not forgiving the loan debt. It's forgiving the United States government's profit. The accrued interest. That is above and beyond. There yeah. are stories of people with student loans who have repaid the loan literally three times over and they're still making payments. Yeah. That's what that forgiveness is about. Yeah. It's a whole different ball of wax. I don't understand how people come on our channel and comment about stuff without reading the facts. Please don't come here unless you've read facts about it. Th knowing that the student loan forgiveness program was about the exorbitant interest and accrued debt from interest. Please stop. Okay. Next. Yeah, and a, a, hold on. Next. <laughs> and as a reminder, the interest rate on, on the COVID-19 EIDL for, for profit businesses is only 3.75% for a 30-year fixed rate loan. That is free money, folks. That's the other thing. Don't come on here and say that the EIDL is predatory lending. Don't. Oh. You will be blocked. Cut yeah. it out. Find out facts. Don't broadcast your ignorance because ignorance is contagious. You will be blocked. Next. Next section in the article. Okay. Linda knows what's coming next. She's going to talk about the word proactive as part of this discussion, but here's what the article says. If a business borrower fails to pay back their EIDL loan, by the way, we don't call it an EIDL loan. You know why? Because the L is loan. Right. We call it an EIDL. Okay. Yeah. If they fail to pay back their EIDL, they will not be able to access federal aid again, ever. On top of that, borrowers who default could see their wages garnished, among other consequences. Yeah. Treasury offsets, seizing tax refunds, seizing Social Security payments, seizing other government payments. We had a couple of clients during a U.S. Treasury dispute consulting who were government contractors, some of them being held up. Doctors with Medicare or Medicaid payments, $30,000, $60,000 a week being held up by the Treasury because of what's called an offset. So there are really dire consequences. And we have been saying this about the program for four years. Yeah. You have to take this program seriously and understand it. This is the part where Linda jumps in with the word proactive mm. and tells you about something you can purchase yes. to help you become proactive. So our EIDL guidebook has every eventuality that you could reference for if you have to make a change. This is a 30-year loan, by the way. You don't think anything's going to happen in your business for the next 30 years? And in 30 years, I've actually had a couple of businesses. So what's the longevity of your business? Could this loan last beyond the existence of your business? These are things you really have to think about. And by the way, they do. The loans do and they can. So you sell your business today, a new buyer can come in, buy your business, and take over the payments on the loan is a whole other that's thing. a process and that's, too and that's in the guidebook the guidebook we created to be a comprehensive on the shelf i'm showing well, our it's, it's showing a, our shelf it's okay? a digital though it's, it's, a digital. it's digital but it's you know on the on the shelf reference guide that anytime you have to interact with the sba on you have your resources email, you just Go to the guidebook, and, and the way Linda designed it is amazing because you go to the table of contents, and any given aspect, change of ownership, selling a business, bankruptcy, default loan, hardship accommodation, you literally just click on that 
chapter or section in the PDF, and it takes you right to that section. So yeah. it's not like you have to hunt around for it. Yeah. We put a lot of time and energy in it, and it works. We got an email yesterday from a client. They used the guidebook because their loans had been sent off to Treasury through mistakes the SBA made, not through their failure to try to pay the loan. This is a common story that we've talked about before. And they use our step-by-step -step instructions in the guidebook to interact with the SBA. They didn't have to pay us our fee. They bought the guidebook. They didn't have to hire some pop-up BS consultant. We know that they're out there. They're charging $1,300, $1,400. One schmuck says, you don't have to pay us until it's done. It's called a success fee. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's scary. That's... You can do it yourself, and it's not complicated. But it is complicated. But I wrote the instructions in a way to help walk you through it. Next. Is, <laughs> this, this next section, is, she's going to have fun with it. Okay. Representative Williams who is quoted multiple times in the article, and he's one of the people leading the charge for the SBA to sell this portfolio. He believes that the SBA doesn't have the bandwidth to service the sprawling portfolio. Wonder why? Because SBA is massively underfunded. You look at any other agency, like the FDA or the uh, FAA, FAA, which FAA. they got their money last summer. Now, they, now they're going after Boeing, after, after hundreds of people have died. Oh my God, you give a federal agency money, it can perform its mission. Oh my goodness, what a radical concept. Again, politicians, blah, 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 saying a lot, but doing nothing. And this person's in Congress. Linda, remind me again, what element of the United States government controls the purse strings of spending for the United hmm, States. I wonder who that could be. Yeah. Congress? <gasps> ding, 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 ding. You didn't have to call a friend. <laughs> Next. Our final section in the article. Representative Williams said in a statement that, quote, the SBA is not serious about <laughs> collecting on any of these taxpayer <laughs> dollars. And on and on and on. Mm. Yeah. This is more of the same with blah, blah, blah. You have to call them out on the blah, blah, blah. Taxpayers pay their salary. We have said other videos where contacting your politicians, this was during the pandemic, we had said uh, contacting your politicians is a waste of time. This is when the SBA wasn't approving loans or the increases where they shut it off at 150, then turned it on at 500, but not to the full 2 million and then did blah, 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 blah. Well, we saw it recently during the treasury debacle of collection accounts that people were contacting their politicians thinking that would help. Listen, they can't really help you. Some yeah. of them can, some of them can't, most of them cannot in the moment of truth when yeah. you're having a problem. But you can be a proactive yeah. constituent. You have to be a spokesperson for your own person. You have to be a spokesperson for your business. You have to be your own advocate for your business. It may have to be a full on campaign. And this is where, you know, how important is it to you? You have to make the time, there's no finding the time. And you could set up your own little campaign where you have some templates. Even if you use AI, if you have to expedite a little bit, make sure you edit whatever the output is and help yourself with a campaign to contact these politicians. Will it work? We don't know. Some of them respond. Some of our clients got responses and the clients think that it was because of the congressperson or the politician. It wasn't. We don't think it so. Wasn't. We think I know it wasn't. Right. I know for a fact you, it was not. You have to still do the work. You can't just contact the politician and not submit the PL. Well, we're talking or, about know. in the in the description you will see the addresses of two committees. One is the Senate committee about small business and entrepreneurship, and the other one is the House of Representatives Committee on Small Business Finance. We're asking you to write a simple letter to the members on those committees and say, please do a better job of supporting the Small Business Administration, especially with the COVID-19 EIDL program. Because if the politicians hear from you and if they act on supporting the SBA instead of yelling at the SBA and demanding outrageous, ridiculous actions from the SBA, by extension, they are supporting you, the small business owner, and they're actually living and walking and talking the same thing, which is small business is the backbone of the American economy. We created templates for these letters, and those are in our SBA COVID-19 EIDL guidebook. As usual, I'm gonna to try to sell the guidebook. <laughs>